as we're progressing through our discussion with regard to the consideration of men who would be elders, shepherds, or bishops, we now come to our discussion of things relative to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. It's not unusual when we begin to think about these two chapters that we begin to put this qualifying description. These are qualifications. I can't take that out of your mind. If you've been around the Lord's church for any number of years, that has been ingrained in your head. I can't take it out. I would rather, however, ask you to consider in a very serious way, that as opposed to calling these qualifications, we call these descriptions. Because the truth of the matter is, as we have been discussing, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are not the end all of how you would go about choosing a man or men to be an elder, shepherd, or bishop. I fear, however, that far too many times when we come to this discussion, this is the place we start and the place we end and have no consideration of the terms or the work that is described. The fact of the matter is, as we'll see today in both lessons, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are not all inclusive lists. They're thumbnail sketches. I'm not suggesting by that they're not important. I am suggesting to you, however, that these are descriptions of a man and his character. I'll have to take you through that now to convince you, or at least ask you to think about it. Also, it's not unusual when we come to this particular stage of the game, since this is where we usually begin and end, is okay, after we're done with this, then what we want, and we have another word we use, we want to nominate. That word kind of leaves a churn in our stomach when we say that, because when we think of nominate, we think of, okay, well, we're going to nominate a cheerleader, or we're going to nominate a student council president or vice president. And so we're going to nominate somebody, and then after we get done nominating that person, what we're going to do is we're going to put that person's name before the church, and then this is said. If you know anything of which he is unqualified to serve, dot, 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 dot. Well, you just gave the prescription for failure. Because 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are not written to Timothy and Titus to disqualify. My observation, doesn't make it true, my observation, is that when we come to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 in this discussion, we go there to disqualify a man as opposed to trying to describe a man. And by the time we get done disqualifying the man, if there's any hair, height, or any flesh left on him at all, by the time he's been chewed up and spit out, all you have is a shell of a person left. And any desire that may have been there in the beginning has certainly had the air let out of its balloon. I know there's mixed metaphors all through that. Has certainly had the air let out of his balloon. Because what we want to do is, if we did not think there was a fault with the man or men before, by the time his name is put, or names put before the church, because he's been nominated, if he didn't know he had flaws before, he'll know he has flaws now, and he'll know exactly what those flaws are. However, 
If what we look at 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is not an all-inclusive list, and again, I'll have to demonstrate that to you, but a thumbnail scratch, sketch of the kind of character a man should have, then at least in my judgment, which doesn't make it right, at least in my judgment, it changes the tenor of the, quali- of the, of the conversation. So when we think about this man, we turn to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 then, and we notice some similarities, first of all. There are similarities throughout the text, but before we look at those similarities and dissimilarities, let me paint this picture for you. If you were to go into the post office and you were to look on a bulletin board of the most wanted by the FBI, and it described the man as eight foot, 560 pounds. Is that all there is to describing that man? Is that all he is, is eight foot and 560 pounds? There might be more to, way, more to that man than eight foot and 560 pounds, but at least what they've done is they've given you a thumbnail of the man, because not everybody's eight foot and 560 pounds. Some of us are barely five seven and maybe 165 pounds. But nonetheless, he's given at least a, a thumbnail sketch of what you're looking at. If you go to the one ads, and you're perusing through the one ads, and it gives a description of the kind of person that is wanted to perform this particular task, and these are the skills that are needed. And one of those skills is able to type 100 words per minute without errors. Well, that rules out a lot of us. Because one of, some of us can't type a word without an error. But what you've done is you've at least given a, a, an abbreviated description of the kind of person you want to have the skill to do the job. So it's not just that you have the character of the person. Does the person have the skill to do the job? And has the job been adequately defined? Has the work been defined? Has the man been defined related to the work that is there? Now, you don't find that in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Furthermore, when Paul wrote to Timothy and wrote to Titus, as far as I know, and I could be wrong about this, Timothy didn't have Titus's list and Titus didn't have Timothy's list. So when Paul gave this to Timothy, did he expect him to seclude himself and figure this out and give it to Titus, and now you seclude yourself and figure it out? And, I, and after the, how long did it take? You know, we go to Acts 6. In Acts 6, it says they are to look out among them and select some men. Are you aware that, that, that Acts 6 doesn't tell us how it's done, it tells us what is done? If the number there is around 5,000, because you have three in, in chapter 2, in chapter 4, you have 5,000 that are numbered there, and it says in Acts chapter 6, they're multiplying, then there's probably more than 5,000 men that are there. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pass out papers and have everybody send in a name of 5,000 people and sign it? Now, that's a way to do it. But could it also have been done by representation? That the apostles represented and the leaders of Israel there represented the people and put forth the names? And then the people had the opportunity to say something about those names? How long did it take to do that? How long did it take Timothy and Titus to do this? Keeping in mind that they understood what elders were. They understood what bishops were. They understood what shepherds were. These weren't were anomalies to them. They were familiar with those terms. They're familiar with those kind of men. I rather think it didn't take that long for them. But when we just begin to describe these men, we begin to put them under the microscope and deal with it in a very mechanical kind of way. Let me use this illustration. 
If you have someone that is an art critic, and what I mean by that is not someone that says, I like this picture, I like that picture, but someone that examines the piece of art to determine its, its veracity, its genuine nature. Did, did so-and-so really, really paint this? And every artist has their particular brush stroke that's peculiar to them. And so here you have the art critic that he takes the small looking glass and he, he microscopically looks down at the painting to examine the brush stroke and say, yeah, yes, yes, Rembrandt really did paint this. Or no, this is a fake. I can tell by the brush strokes. These are not the brush strokes of Rembrandt. But when you look at the painting that way, do you see the painting? But when the art critic backs up and looks back, not at the particular brush stroke that's there, but backs up and looks at the panoramic view, the totality of the picture, you see the beauty of the painting that is there. I'm suggesting that 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are not to be considered from a mechanical microscopic type of thing is the brush stroke right but you back up and look at the picture that's painted here of the kind of man that Paul's describing to Timothy and is describing to Titus and I'd rather think about that that by the time it's done because Timothy did not have Titus and Titus did not have Timothy that the man or men that are going to be chosen are measurably going to be no different even though there are some significant differences in their list and I would suggest something else. If we had never had 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and all we have were to describe the term elder, the term bishop, and the term shepherd, and look at their work, would we have principally found a man or men any different than the kind of men that are described in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1? I'd rather think a serious person, mind, a serious minded person would say, those are the very kind of men I would look and find. Because you're not going to find the opposite of those kind of men doing those kinds of things or described in the kind of ways we've described them as elders, bishops, and shepherds. And as we've looked at their work, you're going to look at a man that is described as Paul describes to Timothy and to Titus. So even though Timothy doesn't have Titus and Titus doesn't have Timothy, and there are significant differences in the list. What you're going to see is they're going to principally wind up with the same kind of man, even though those differences are there. So you have the job description. I rather think one of our conundrums is because what we're do as we're going to do, I acknowledge I'm going to do this. I'm going to contradict myself. I understand that. What we do is we take and we parse every word. And in parsing every word, what we're doing is we're only looking at the brush stroke. We're not looking at the overall picture. And we miss the picture that's taken there. But alas, we look at the words and then paint the picture because alas, the words do paint a picture. But if all we do is simply parse the words and say, okay, him, not him, him, not him, and go forward in that, then we're not looking at the descriptions that are given here of these kind of men. So, instead of parsing those terms, we begin then to look at some things. And let's just read beginning in 1 Timothy 3, in verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules well his own house, one who rules well his own house. One who, one who rules his own house well. Having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare. 
Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Beginning in verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused, of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled, holding fast the word of faith as has been taught that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince, convict those who are, who are contradictory. Let me describe, first of all, the things in the list that are the same. The same in the list are, you have blameless, you have sober-minded, able to teach is not listened Listed the same way, but able to teach and hold fast the word, correspond together, so they're compliments of each other. Hospitable, not given to wine, not violent, rulers of his own house, not quick tempered, although not quick tempered would be corresponding to temperate, so you have those two that might be companions. Not quarrelsome is not mentioned that way in both lists, but it would correspond to one who is not self-willed. So accommodatively, we would use able to teach, hold fast the word. We would use not quick-tempered and temperate. We'd use not quarrelsome and self-willed. We'd put those all in the list of those who are in the list together. Those are the same things that each one has. Not listed together. And again, some significant difference. is gentle. Not a novice. Not covetous. Of good testimony. Of good behavior. Just. And holy. How is Timothy going to wind up choosing the kind of men or teaching about the kind of men so the church at Ephesus could select the kind of men. If just and holy is not mentioned there, if covetous is not mentioned there, if not a novice is not mentioned there, if good behavior is not mentioned there, if gentle is not mentioned there, how in the world is he going to do that? Because there's one word in both lists that I think is the umbrella term for both of them. And that word is, for both, blameless. If you just think in the list of things we've just read from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and use the umbrella and put blameless there, everything that is described thereafter is going to be under that umbrella of describing the man as blameless. So the man who's going to be an elder, a bishop, or a shepherd is a man who is blameless. Now, I'm not going to define the terms this morning. I'm just talking about in 1050, we'll talk about the definitions of some things. I'm just talking about some, some, some concepts of some things this morning. But you're going to talk about a man who is blameless. If you have a man that's blameless, is he going to be a man that's just and holy? If you're going to have a man that's blameless, is he going to be a man that's uh, gentle? If you're going to have a man that's blameless, is he going to have good behavior and a good report outside? If you're going to have a man that's blameless, uh, is he going to be quarrelsome? Is he going to be self-willed? Is he going to be, uh, is he going to be violent? If you have a man that, that's blameless, is he going to be a man that's given to, given to wine? If you have a man that's blameless, is he going to be a man that's given to chasing women? What you're looking at is describing a man that is blameless. Now, whether I can describe and define blameless to your satisfaction or not, Here's my suggestion to you. You know it when you see it. You really don't need Webster 
You don't need American Heritage Dictionary. American Heritage Dictionary. You really don't need Oxford English Dictionary. Do you know blameless when you see blameless? I would suggest we do. And I think that's what Paul is telling Timothy and Titus. And that's why even though there's those differences that are there, you'd have the same kind of man that's being described. And so you see, if we rid ourselves of just parsing terms and rid ourselves of the mechanical approach that we take to things, then how long is it going to be before we find a man or men that is blameless? Let me ask this question for you. Which of the things in the list, both lists, I just described to you are expected of a Christian? Which of the things I just read to you from these two passages are expected of a Christian? As far as I can tell, and I could be wrong about this, I may have missed something. I came up with three or four. A Christian doesn't have to be the husband of one wife. A Christian doesn't have to have children. A Christian doesn't have to be able to teach, although in the beginning you ought to be able to tell somebody about why you obeyed the gospel. Pause. Pause. If you've had some significant event in your life, maybe if you're married, maybe if you have children, maybe, maybe you're just a, a mentor to somebody, maybe you're single and you're a mentor to somebody, maybe you're single and you've helped somebody, if you've had some significant event in your life, can you describe that? And can you describe it in detail because that's something that was significant that happened in your life? Now, able to teach Maybe able to describe some things, but maybe he's not able to take the word and hold it fast like we're talking about. So a Christian doesn't necessarily have to be able to teach to the depth we're talking about with holding fast the word. But as far as I can tell, except for husband of one wife, not having children, not able to teach, and furthermore, a novice. A Christian doesn't have to be, you have to be a novice to be a Christian. You have to have a husband or one wife, you have to have children, and you don't have to be a novice. In fact, all of us start out as a novice somewhere. As far as I can tell, those four things are the only four things in this list that are not descriptive of a person who is a Christian. Other things are expected. What is a Christian in their character expected to be? If you were to put an umbrella term, one umbrella term over describing a person who's a Christian, what would that umbrella term be? Would that umbrella term maybe be blameless? Might it be blameless? But here is the the thing. It may be that the things we're talking about are not held in the same degree by everybody. For example, let's just take gentle for a moment. Is it possible that there are some people that are gentle and other people that are more gentle? You take a person who's become a Christian and they've been violent. But they're working on it and they're they're trying hard to become a gentle person. Are the people that are more gentle? When when, when you think about that, uh, you think about the idea of able to teach. Are the people that are more able to teach than others? Are those, there are those who have developed some proficiency in teaching that, that others are developing in their teaching? You see, at least while these things are to be characteristic of a Christian, they are in degree there. They're not absolute. If what we're doing is coming to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and looking for the absolute man described here, you're not even going to have the Peter. And you're not going to have anybody. Because when you think about blameless, blameless doesn't mean he has no weaknesses. Not all weaknesses you can hide. Some weaknesses are before everybody. (laughs) And so that element of blameless has some degree of proficiency in it. Here's a man that is blameless and here's a man that is developing to become more blameless. And so if, if you were to have some glasses up here 
and you would have three or four glasses lined up here, and in one glass you had a level here, another glass you had a level here, another glass you had a level here. Is the man that's here have gentle? Is he gentle? Yes. Is he as gentle as this man? Is he as gentle as that man? Nobody's demonstrated a what? A proficiency at being gentle. He's demonstrated a proficiency at something. Now, there are some things you develop and some things you don't develop. Husband, one wife, you either are or you aren't. Children, you either have them or you don't. But when you think about the things that, that are described here, you're thinking about there's some, some element of, defi- of, of proficiency that a man has developed in this. And I would suggest to you that when a man begins as an elder or shepherd or bishop, he begins as a baby elder, shepherd or bishop. You know the maturation state physically? I'm told, I know nothing about this, I'm just told this, so take it for what that's worth. That if a child goes from laying on their back to walking, that there are some significant stages that have been developed that affect their development. And that when these babies learn to roll over and they learn to get on their fours and they rock back and forth, rock it back and forth, and finally they, they rock forward and they fall flat on their face. And finally they figure out not to do that. Finally they figure out how to put one knee in front of the other. Finally they figure out how to stand in the fall. Take two steps, then take three steps. And next thing you know they're running. That there's a development process in that. It's the same thing. If you have a man that begins today, this very day as an elder, shepherd, or bishop, he is not going to be as developed and proficient as Joe Fagan is. Because Joe's been doing it for 36 years. That doesn't mean when Joe was 45 years old and he started, he had the proficiency he has now. But that's been developed, that maturity, that process has been developed in the process of how he's grown in the role and the kind of man that's described here. What I'm telling you is, is when you look at the description of these kind of men, you're not looking at someone that is absolutely perfect, has every one of these things with the eyes dotted and the T's crossed, and there's no flaw there. And if you're looking for the man with no flaw, you're not going to find him because you don't have to look too long, too hard to find flaws in each other. And as I said in the beginning, if you don't know you have flaws, by the time you're done in the process, you'll know every flaw you have, you'll know where every tick crawls and every flea lies. Because people will be glad to tell you where they are. You see, what he's talking about here is we begin with having demonstrated some proficiency in being blameless and the things we're going to describe at 1050. But that doesn't mean the maturity there is fully developed. It is developed to a point of proficiency and therefore a man in whom we can put trust and confidence in because he's demonstrated a proficiency in some of these things. I was talking with D. Bowman years ago about a concern I had with a particular man serving as an elder. And he just said, Ricky, just give him time. He'll get his elder's legs. And he did. And he wound up being a great elder. And that's true, true with everyone that begins. You just have to get your elder legs. That doesn't mean you know what you're doing absolutely. I remember the day that Breck and I were appointed. Joe came to me in the foyer, and there was a case of benevolence to be considered. Joe came and he said, Ricky, we've had this question come before before us. Uh, What do you think about this? I thought, why are you asking me? I thought, Joe, you and Daryl have been doing it. Don't ask me. I wasn't there then. He was asking me because that morning I'd been asked to serve as an elder in the congregation, accepted it. It blew me away that Joe said, hey, Ricky, what do you think about this case of benevolence? Oh, I'm wearing a different hat now. But it's not the hat he wears. Do you see what I'm talking about here? There's growth in this. There's growth in doing this. But as I've said, these are all the descriptions. This is a thumbnail list. For example, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, you do not find the term elder, shepherd, or bishop listed. At least in this section of Scripture. You do find it in verse 11, but in the section I'm talking about from 17 forward, you don't find it listed. What you find listed about evangelists, pastors, and teachers 
is not relative to what he's talking about, verse 17 forward. But what he will say, beginning in verse 20, but you've not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Question, did you read anything in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 about putting off and putting on? Didn't read a word, did you? You didn't read a word in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 about a man repenting. Furthermore, it says, therefore, and the idea is having put away lying, let each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him that stole still no more, no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, Anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Did you read any of those in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1? Would you want a man that's a liar? Would you want a man that steals? Would you want a man that can't control his temper? Would you want a man that's filled with bitterness, malice, and ill will? No. Why? Because that kind of man is not blameless. But you don't find, if we're going to parse the terms now, if we're just going to parse the terms, we're going to count the brush strokes. Brush strokes, okay, you've got some brush strokes here that aren't included. But is the kind of man he's describing that put off, is that the kind of man we want in that particular responsibility? No, we understand that. So there's more to describing the kind of man. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You have this man that's described beginning in verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among, among you and such is sexual, sexually immoral as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Okay, he can't be the husband of one wife and do that. But it doesn't talk about sexual immorality. Can you have a man that's sexually immoral? Well, he wouldn't be the husband of a wife. Okay, yeah, but it doesn't say not sexually immoral. You see what I'm talking about? There's more to describing the man than the picture that's painted in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. There are thumbnail sketches and there are thumbnail sketches that can help us arrive at describing the kind of heart and character a man should have. And when we have the total picture of what an elder is, of what a bishop is and what a shepherd is and the kind of work they do, then what kind of man are you going to find? You're going to find a man that's blameless and that fits the descriptions of a man that's blameless in a thumbnail sketch in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. So let me review this with you. When we think about this, I just want you to look at the descriptions that are here. I want you to look at this as a painting, okay? Words painting a picture here. I want you to see this not from the brush strokes. I want you to see this from the, from the st standpoint of a, of a mosaic that's painted here. And the mosaic you have is a man that's temperate, one of good behavior, who's hospitable, able to teach, one who's not given to wine, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not greedy for money, not covetous, not a novice, one who has a good testimony, but is not self-willed, a man that's not quick-tempered and loves what is good, just and holy, and self-controlled. Do we have to define those terms? Do you know him when you see him? Let's look at it from, let's look at it from another vantage point. Look at it from the vantage point of what is positive and what is negative. Positively, a man is blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, temperate, sober, lover of hospitality, faithful children, good report, just and holy. And I can't read the last two. But you see them. Negative. Not given to wine, not a betrayer, not a brawler, not a striker, not greedy, not a novice, not angry, not self-willed. When you see him, do you know him? 
Let me give you one other vantage point. Look at it from the standpoint of those things that are physical. A man, husband, father, moral, blameless, good behavior, hospitality, not given to wine, no striker, patient, not greedy, not a broil at self-will, love what is good, not soon to anger and temperate, spiritual, vigilant, sober, apt to teach, not covetous, not a novice, of good report, holy. You see what this encompasses? This encompasses the mental part of man, the physical part of man, the spiritual part of man, and the social part of man. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 describe, describe a picture of the kind of man that you would know when you see that you would ask to be your representative with spiritual judgment because he is of some age to have demonstrated that. Who has shepherded your soul and has watched over you and is doing that work with you. You see the similarities and some of the dissimilarities that are there. So my exhortation to you is this. Every Christian is in the process of developing. Some are further along the scale than others on the growth continuum. But there ought to be, in this man we're describing, some proficiency has developed in his character to have demonstrated these kinds of descriptions and attributes that has produced in me and in you a degree of confidence and a degree of trust. So that what we will say is, I want you to shepherd my soul and watch over me. And what I'm doing is I'm putting the well-being of my soul in your hand. Will you, will you watch for my soul? I just ask you to consider those things this morning. Again, some of the qualifi qualifications I made, the descriptions of things, that's my, my angst, my deal. But I'm trying to disabuse us of some things that are often problematic for us. These are not given so we can pick a man apart. These are given because we know this kind of man when we see him. Thank you for listening. We'll have a song and word of prayer and then be dismissed to our classes. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.